So first of all, I'd like to warmly thank you, Anne, Karen, and Sarah for organizing this important session dedicated to the life and legacy of Mary. It's a pity we all couldn't be there in person, uh, but such are these troubling times. So the news of Mary's passing hit me hard as I had just returned from a much delayed field work on Bonaire and Curacao, uh, still in the haze from the loss of my father-in-law a few weeks earlier. Mary and I had exchanged emails in late March of that year as the coronavirus pandemic had us all in lockdown on both sides of the Atlantic. And in typical Mary fashion, she had an anecdote on food, mentioning she had just had her third shipment of oysters delivered to perfect her oyster shucking skills and to obviously also enjoy the little mollusks. Keep well, she signed up, M. I first met Mary in the lobby of a hotel in Baltimore at the 2011 SHA. I was a fan of hers, and uh, I had already read some of her articles in college and her outstanding microhistorical archaeologies, her deft analytical eye, and her charismatic prose had really enthralled me. At the time, I was a spooked and timid recent college graduate, and uh, I approached her awkwardly, introducing myself and mentioning I was going to apply to the doctoral program at BU, hoping she could perhaps be my supervisor. This super professor was so affable. She was so down to earth. She was so chatty. So I applied and I was accepted and it turned out I was going to be one of her last PhD students. But because of life circumstances, however, I eventually ended up going to live in Mary. Yet, once I was ABD, I immediately invited her to join my doctoral committee, uh, which she enthusiastically accepted. We only met one more time in person uh, in a gastro pub in Williamsburg, together with other graduate students after a brown bag uh, she gave at the department. I remember Mary ordered oysters rock and roll. So Mary became a mentor and a friend, and her work has been a fount of inspiration in my career. At that same brown bag at William and Mary, she presented gastronomical archaeology, food, materiality, and practices of dieting. At the time, I was wrestling with making sense of the hundreds of vessels that had identified at the 18th century campsites uh, by the salt pan of the Venezuelan island of La Papua. And I was both bedazzled and challenged by the growing theoretical literature on entanglement, materiality and thingness, as well as Tim Ingold's ruminations on knots and lines. Could something bring these seemingly disparate and high-flying theories down to earth, help organize my broken vessels and bring them back to life in the hands of long gone seafarers? As Mary had urged, we need to view an archeological collection not just in terms of what fits back together, literally, and can be mended and included in the vessel count, but also to discover what fits back together in terms of practices and to attempt to comprehend what the intended outcomes of various practices might have been." End quote. I hadn't read this excerpt in Mary's then recent article in Northeastern Historical Archaeology, Feasting on Broken Glass, yet, at William and Mary, at the William and Mary brown bag, where she conveyed similar, similar ideas, I realized we were both on the same wavelength and both onto something. In that same 2013 article, Mary continued and wrote, quote, this requires considering more than just the individual artifact or artifact type used, but attempting to reconstruct, for want of a better phrase, assemblages of practice, or perhaps ensembles of practice, end quote. Six years later, Mary and I published a joint article in Archaeological Dialogues on Assemblages of Practice, the conceptual framework that undergirded my doctoral research. It had unmistakably drawn from Mary's visionary approach to reconstructing past meals in New England, including her emphasis on mealtimes as embodied experiences and total events where people and things were enveloped by an ambiance of sounds, smells, sights, and tastes. Also drawing from Mary's methodological acuity, it was buttressed by detailed and qualitative minimum number of vessel counts and interwoven with multiple lines of evidence, including museum artifacts, images, 
documentary evidence. Mary and I envision assemblages of practice as an integrated and bridge building conceptual framework, straddling the often gaping divide between deep theory and raw data. So much theory we saw was either jargon filled and sprinkled as magic pixie dust on uh, data or too particularistic to be widely applicable. So I'll present here a, a quick breakdown of a concept which she and I had hoped would be an inspiration to grad students struggling to make sense of the nexus of data and theory, and also researchers feeling apprehensive or perhaps out of step with new theoretical discussions. So what was born is a framework based on a clear distinction between things and objects, a distinction that is too often muddied in the social sciences and humanities. In our article, we base our understanding of things on the definitions of archaeologist Ian Hodder and anthropologist Tim Ingram. So to illustrate this simply, to us, things are vibrant, like verbs, whereas objects are static, like nouns. Secondly, at the heart of our framework is a non-representational concept of entanglement, fleshed out by Hodder. Humans and things are relationally produced in entanglements, and their study is meant to get us beyond treating things merely as backdrops or conduits to meaning. So entanglement thus explores how material things create specific practical entrapments between humans and themselves. In our approach, for the first time, Mary and I propose that the densities of entanglements can be helpfully conceptualized by utilizing three scales. The smallest knots of entanglement occur through concrete human actions in specific places. Meshes are groupings of such knots that involve human communities in the medium term time scale of everyday life. These are assemblages of practice. Finally, the meshwork, borrowed from Ingold, is composed of a multiplicity of meshes and countless knots of humans and things. It is often regional or even global and spatial scale and can only be studied from the perspective of the long term. So entanglements exist at multiple spatial temporal scales, yet they originate through concrete human actions during everyday life. So as archaeologists, how can we study them? First, we're faced with the intermediate analytical step of feasting, as Mary would say, on broken glass, on shirts, seeds, and bones, those inert objects we excavate and study with each other by organizing or re-entangling them into groupings of objects involved in past practices. This can be done through contextual, depositional, or spatial in situ associations, and by using independent lines of evidence, especially documentary and visual evidence from interview. Notably, these groupings are artificially and temporarily severed from the past living individuals and dynamic communities, which through their practices, engaged with vibrant things, not static objects. Here the concept of assemblage comes in handy. While much ink has been spilled on its definitions, some of which are frankly quite nebulous and confusing, we broadly agree that assemblages are collected with things that cohere in stronger or weaker ways for longer or shorter durations. Once again, our interest lies not with in-between laboratory objects, but with dynamic and vibrant things and their entanglement with humans. It follows then that an assemblage of practice is a dynamic gathering of entangled things corresponding to everyday human practice. It is a theater of correspondence. So now what's correspondence? Correspondence is central to assemblages of practice as according to Ingold, it is quote, the dynamic in between us of sympathetic relations, end quote, rather than the quote static betweenness of articulation, end quote. Things are sympathetic, objects are articulative. So assemblages of practice are therefore best reassembled by marshalling all the evidentiary lines available to an archeologist today. The more detail, the better. It's important to note here that our assemblages of practice uh, is not a theory, but it's an integrative 
conceptual framework that bridges deep theory and messy archaeological data. In this way, we wanted to make sure it steers clear of being another theory just for theory's sake. So just here as a, a small example, these are, for example, um, objects excavated from the site of Punta Salinas uh, on La Tortuga. Uh, you have here a water bottle, an onion bottle, a punch bowl, 18th century objects. Uh, they're severed at this stage from past humans, the past humans who use them. In this next step, we group these objects. And here, for example, these objects are grouped um, into objects that were used um, in punch drinking. So you have, for example, nutmeg, sugar, lime, these things that archaeologists can't necessarily find in the archaeological record, but documentary evidence uh, and so forth can help us reconstruct uh, their presence. And finally, we re-entangle this grouping of objects with the past human community. And this is the final step. These are assemblages of practice. So here, for example, you have this uh, depiction from the late 18th century, um, the mid 18th century uh, captains carousing in Suriname. And you have you have a tavern. They're drinking punch, uh, but these things are vibrant. Uh, they're being used by them. Um, they're being poured over other people's heads. Uh, they're being uh, a, 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 a drunk from. So these are the final assemblages of practice of everyday life uh, that we're aiming at. Um, the sights, sounds, the smells, uh, the voices, um, these things entangled with humans. So assemblages of practice draw us near to scrutinizing the heart of past human thing entanglements. They provide us with a practical heuristic with which we can make informed comparisons, revealing changes and continuities in human practice through space and time. They emphasize the preeminence of things in social life, yet are firmly grounded in what Mary called the human dimension. Mary and I didn't want to flirt with post-humanism or the new materialisms or even assemblage theory, just to be trendy and in step with the times. We had hoped, if anything, that our article would offer a fresh way of articulating the many theories and concepts produced in recent years and to help build common ground in archaeology from the unique vantage point that historical archaeology offers. So assemblages of practice bears the indelible marks of a project born in the large intellectual footsteps of Mary Baudry. Like no other, Mary looked beyond shirts to whole plates, cups, mugs, and jugs, and beyond these to the vibrant practices they were part and parcel of in everyday life. She brought to life the smells of roast mutton wafting through the air at supper, the jovial din of merrymaking, the flickering candles of a sumptuous repast. Perhaps many of you in this room today, uh, or many of you watching this video, um, better said, had the fortune of sharing many a meal with Mary. Uh, while I only shared one in person, I can say that through her writing, I came to partake of quite a few, whether in Newbury or in Lowell. Uh, historical archaeology has lost its way, yet her memory lives on in every past meal we meticulously reassemble, and especially in every oyster we slip. Here's to Mary. <laughs>